Venus Wars is amazing. If you're watching this and you're familiar with Venus Wars and you're about to comment about how mediocre it is, just know that I don't care. I have nostalgia for it. It was the first real anime I ever consumed when I discovered it back in the ancient times of the 1990s, during the Saturday anime block on the Sci-Fi Channel. Saturday mornings on the Sci-Fi Channel, it's Japanese animation in the raw, and this ain't no swim in the kiddie pool. Saturday anime on the Sci-Fi Channel. Yeah, what can I say kids? The 90s were just a wondrous time to be alive. Anime was just starting to have its boom in the US, but there was no Crunchyroll or Netflix, Funimation, streaming services. If you wanted to watch anime, you had to know where to find it. The Sci-Fi Channel, aware of the emerging market for all things anime at the time, started grabbing up as many English dubs as they could find and shoved them right onto the air. So if not for Sci-Fi Channel, I may have missed out on some truly amazing things. For that, I'm thankful to them. Even if some of the things they did to promote it back then were a little cringe. Welcome to the Sci-Fi Channel's Anime Film Festival. Groovy. We are rocking your world with the hottest craze in entertainment today. It's a Japanese take on animation called anime. Yeah, like I said, wondrous time to be alive. But anyway, back to Venus Wars. Why is it so awesome? Well, it's 80s as fuck. I mean, just listen. All that wondrous 80s sound is due to the fact that the movie was released in 1989, which is only two years removed from peak 80s-ness, which is scientifically proven to be the year 1987. That was the peak of the 80s, as this is the year Def Leppard released Pour Some Sugar On Me, the number one most often played song at strip clubs when your grandma was on stage. Anime from the 80s and early 90s has some of my favorite character designs, and Venus Wars is really no exception. In fact, the man responsible for the character design, uh, <clears throat> Yoshikazu Yasuhiko, nailed it, who also created the manga the film is based on and is the film's director, will be someone that you're probably familiar with even if you haven't seen Venus Wars, and assuming you're old like me. He worked on several notable anime from that era, including Space Battleship Yamato, Mobile Suit Gundam, Mobile Suit Zeta Gundam, and one of my favorite hidden gems, Crusher Joe. Screw it up, but it was that Val, 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 Val. Yeah, when I get yeah. my hands on him, a little mistake, and then he's got to come. The art design in general for this film is great. Throughout the movie, you'll notice that everything is wrapped in red tones, which bring a very otherworldly feel to the environment. Venus is a very desolate and harsh world, and that's conveyed to the audience pretty well, with everything being washed in this reddish hue. Everything from the buildings to vehicles are designed in such a way that they convey that they're not just adaptations of real world existing tanks or planes. Everything looks like it belongs on another world. And all this delicious eye candy is wrapped up in a bow of a questionable English dub like most anime at the time. I recommend you watch the original Japanese with subtitles if you're going to really enjoy this, but we're going to talk about the English dub here because that's how I first experienced the movie. Ah, shit! While writing this, I discovered a new English dub of the film was recently released. I've read other people say that it's better, uh, a closer adaptation to the original Japanese as far as translation goes. I've yet to see this new dub, mostly because I can't find it in stock anywhere. I guess it was a limited release, and I must have missed the boat. No way! So I can't comment other than to say, it's a thing that exists. The original dub contains changes to the dialogue and details, but having watched it with the original Japanese dialogue as well, I believe the overall themes are essentially the same. Probably the biggest difference is some of the subtleties in the backstory of our protagonist, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. So the protagonist is Hiro, and there's also a secondary protagonist named Susan Summers. And she exists to occasionally annoy you with her voice that sounds like someone beating a mouse to death with a boiling tea kettle. 
We're in the future, obviously, and humans have colonized the planet Venus, and that's where the film takes place, which is probably uh, something you've already figured out by now. There are two warring nations on Venus, Aphrodia and Ishtar. The subtitle version of the film provides a little more clarity and nuance to the war plot, while the English dub can be a little vague. But all you need to know for the purposes of this review is that Ishtar wants to conquer Aphrodia, and Aphrodia is not doing a particularly great job of being not conquered. Susan is a reporter from Earth that has come to Io, capital of Aphrodia, to exploit the suffering of others to get her big break. Uh, I, I mean, to cover the conflict. So she lands on Venus, is sexually harassed and borderline assaulted by what I assume the Venusian version of customs is, huh. Scumbags. then goes to a bar, where she gets the scoop on the situation from a bartender, paying him for the info with some delicious camel cigarettes. The bartender says he's heard rumors Ishtar might attack the city itself, only to have that very thing happen about, um, five seconds later. Oh, he also gives her a gun, left behind by a previous reporter. This is essentially forgotten about until the payoff near the end of the film, so just remember she has it. At the same time, Hero is in the middle of a badass battle bike race, a thing that should definitely exist in real life, where people on one-wheeled motorbikes, or monobikes on the account of the, you know, one wheel, increasing their mentalness by 100%, try to murder each other. It's established here that Hero tends to be a little aggressive and reckless, much to the annoyance of old man Gary here, who is the team's coach, captain, mechanic. Um, yeah, we'll go with all three of those. We're also introduced to Hero's girlfriend, Maggie. The other girls who I assume are whatever this sports version of cheerleaders are, and several other team members who are additional side characters that you're going to have to keep track of. Personally, I like Rob. You may find him annoying, but you would be wrong, because Rob is awesome. Wham! Right in the balls! <laughs> anyway, the race is brought to a halt when the attack from Ishtar begins. Miranda, the queen of Heroes team, is not too happy about this, which seems like a reasonable take considering there's a massive battle happening around her. Hero speeds off on his own for a little war zone sightseeing. He relays to the team that the road is blocked and they'll have to find another way to safety. Then, forgetting he's in a fucking war zone, almost gets himself blown up. Then, his bike gets crushed under a tank. So, all in all, not a great day for Hero. Susan, being insane, has been filming the battle in the city. She almost becomes roadkill as she finds herself in the path of a buggy driven by Will. Susan takes the opportunity to invite herself into the vehicle, much to the annoyance of Will's girlfriend. The rest of the battle is summed up for us with some text on the screen over a montage of destruction, basically explaining that Ishtar is kinda like, GG, easy clap, lol. Once the dust settles, the Aphrodian forces withdraw, leaving the city of Io under enemy control. At first, Hero and company lay low at Gary's place while the new normal takes hold. Ishtar has implemented a curfew, have set up security checkpoints, and have armed soldiers stationed in public areas. This essentially sets the stage for the rest of the film, with Io becoming a police state. I don't want to go too much farther into the story itself, otherwise this would just be a summary of the film as opposed to what my thoughts on it are. The gist of it is, after a series of events, witnessing the world around them changing, and succumbing to anger at how the government has just rolled over and even their own police are working with the occupiers, the group of misfits that had nothing better to do than be punks and chase adrenaline on their bikes decide they're going to fight back. They hatch a plan to destroy one of the seemingly unstoppable enemy tanks now occupying their territory, the racetrack. Ultimately, it's this decision that will inadvertently plunge the group far deeper into a war they didn't plan to fight. The remainder of the film explores the aggressiveness of those in power, what they'll do for victory, the violence of war, the human cost of the war, and how Hero evolves from a disillusioned, hot-headed biker punk to a man that has to deal with the situation he finds himself in and attempt to do something about the world he lives in instead of just being angry about how it's done him wrong. If you've never heard of Venus Wars, then you might be wondering, Well, if this anime is as good as this nobody on YouTube says it is, then why haven't I heard of it? Obviously not much of a classic. Well, first, shut up. It is a classic, and I will die on that hill. But realistically, even I had to admit this film has its flaws. As stated earlier, I think the visuals in the film are incredible. 
but Venus Wars was released after the stunning visual orgasm that is Akira, which I'm sure you've heard of. So, while Venus Wars does some things that were impressive for its time, it's no Akira. Additionally, the animation can be a little, uh, unstable at times. For me, this is forgivable enough because it only happens every once in a while, and I'm easily distracted by how generally beautiful everything looks. Although, nothing can excuse or forgive the decision to use live-action environments mixed with animated vehicles for a couple of brief segments. It, it takes you right out of the film, and it's utterly distracting. What the fuck? Oh no, 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 no. No, 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 no. Ultimately, the biggest detractor for this film, unfortunately, is the plot. First, Venus Wars is stuffed to the brim with characters, and it tries to juggle the story of the protagonist, the political drama unfolding in the B-plot, and a list of secondary characters, and the film struggles to find a place to fit them all in. There's just too much going on, and nothing gets a chance to properly develop. Eventually, everything is focused down into Hero and Susan's stories, but the path they get there is filled with tropes. I mean, seriously, look up Venus Wars on TV tropes, and you'll see what I mean. Another issue for me is that it seems as if too much happens off-screen. Hero goes from being abandoned in the middle of a war zone to, to being on a trip with Maggie shopping when we next see him. Kathy, later, throws exposition to the audience that she and Will broke up because Will has fallen for Susan. But to us, Susan and Will only met like yesterday. Damn, Will moving fast. I get it though. You gotta lock that down. Do you mind if I suggest you uncross those interesting lengths? I think there's some time jumps in the film that aren't really made clear. In general, I excuse this in my brain as us seeing small snippets of the story taking place over weeks or months, but I can't blame viewers for feeling a little confused even if that's true. The plot is clunky at best. The film doesn't give you a chance to grow an attachment to all of its supporting characters, so we as the audience don't feel the weight of loss when the war inevitably results in death. We just aren't given much reason to care about everyone. I think this is the result of Yasuhiko himself. I haven't read the manga, even after telling myself several times over the years that I should, but I get the feeling that an OVA or miniseries might have been a better way to adapt the story in a way that feels less rushed. Then again, the budget for that likely wouldn't have allowed for the same level of detail and beautiful artwork. When adapting this manga to film, I think Yasuhiku had an attachment to each of these characters and did his best to squeeze them all in, no matter how insignificant they end up being to the story. One character in particular comes to mind. You know what? Brave guys are dumbbells. Take my advice, if you want to survive, keep your head down. What I like, the best of all, is firing one of my missiles at an octo. Pow! Hey, that's power, man. Jeez, what a turn on. Makes a man f In the end, the plot can't support them all, and some things probably should have been left on the cutting room floor to make room for more interesting plot points. I have a feeling the manga tells a much larger story involving everything from the political players to the military commanders. For example, one aspect that's different in the manga, that I've read online anyway, is that the city of Ayo actually barely repels the initial attack by Ishtar, which then leads to an escalation of the conflict that results in the invasion, whereas in the film, the city falls pretty much immediately. Something like this makes sense to condense the source material, but I think Yasuhiku couldn't quite squeeze a cohesive story into the length of the film. Ultimately, like I said in the beginning, my love for Venus Words is about 50% nostalgia, 15% the wonderfully drawn, well, everything, and 35% the absolutely amazing score. That should come as no surprise to anime fans, because the film is scored by the John Williams of Japan, Joe Hiyasashi. In closing, Venus Wars is a film that takes me back to a simpler time in my life, of sitting in my bedroom at 13 years old with my little tube TV and not a care in the world. A time when I was first discovering anime, or first played Final Fantasy VII, or still had time to ride my bike with my friends from my neighborhood. I know that doesn't make it a great film, 
but it does make it one of my favorites. And to this day, I can still remember the feeling I had the first time I saw the end of this film and heard the closing theme playing. And I thought to myself, wow, I've never seen something like this before. I wonder what'll be on next week. I can't wait to find out.